So this summer, my elderly grandma got dramatically less healthy and began living with my parents. My parents have a den in the front of the house in a staircase that begins off the same foyer. Anyway, they tried to make grandma as comfortable as possible for the last few months of her life. They moved a TV in there, a few of her things from home, and my sister got a brand new Echo Show to display the time and weather. Sadly, grandma began to show signs that she was nearing the end. I came back home to see her for a few days before she passed. While it was definitely uneasy watching a loved one pass, it didn't seem creepy or unnerving. Everything seemed normal. The echo in the corner, her in her bed, and visitors coming and going. About a week later, she passed in her room. And that evening I went back into that room and the Amazon Echo loudly yelled out the time. It had never done that before. Scared me to death. I continued to sit in the den and play the piano there. And suddenly again, it happened. I ran out of there and asked my mum if she'd heard it in the next room. She had, but didn't think much of it. I figure it's just a random tech thing. Fast forward to tonight, we're back visiting for Labor Day weekend. And as I'm carrying things up the staircase across the foyer, it yelled out the time again. I threw my suitcase. Then, as I gathered myself, it did it again. I ran upstairs and this time my fiancé heard it. I know I'm not crazy, and this happened multiple times. I've googled, can Echo talk without prompt? Amazon proximity telling time, motion sense talking, etc. There's no TV on and it's silent except for the AC running. My fiancé said it's her saying hi to me or something, but I don't buy that. There's got to be a rational reason why this is happening. It was last summer. My girlfriend, now wife, and I finally made the big decision to move in together. Cobblestone Square is a location of apartment complex surrounding a centre park. After living in another apartment for two years, I learned a bigger apartment was opening up on the other side of the complex. We needed a bigger space because my wife had two children from a previous marriage. After a rushed inspection, we were happy to move in as June started. The months passed by and the days grew shorter and colder. Autumn was drawing close and with it, that's when the trouble began. In all the stories and movies, it starts out small. Things moving from place to place, lights being left on, etc. All chalked up to forgetfulness. This was true in our case and we didn't think much of it. It only started to escalate with the children. Our apartments are set up with two bedrooms and a bath on the opposite end of each other. In our bedroom, we have our own private bathroom and next to the kids' room is a small hallway leading to their own bathroom. We would give them baths here and potty train and almost as if flicking a switch. When the autumn months came, our youngest, a two-year-old girl, would absolutely hate going in that bathroom. At the mere mention of bath time, she would go into hysterics or... On good days, she would sit in the tub and in the process of bathing, she would look past myself or my wife and start screaming and crying. Oftentimes something would catch her eye in the mirror and she would also start crying like mad. The most unsettling part would be that as soon as we took her out of the bathroom, she would stop and act like nothing happened. Our son, who was four at the time, also would run up to us and say that he would hear a voice saying, Uppy which is a common saying among children when they wanted to be held. We asked if it was his sister, and he would profusely say it wasn't her. But he did say it sounded like a kid. This happened a few times. With my wife being separated from her first husband and splitting custody, we would have the children come live with us every other week. On the weeks that the children would go stay with their dad, the activity would seem to die down, but that didn't mean it wouldn't happen. I asked my wife what she remembered from last year and she recounted a time when we didn't have the children and she was cleaning the house. She noticed the kids door was open. We usually keep it closed but thought that maybe I went into their room for something. Checking to see if I was inside and seeing I wasn't, she closed the door and didn't think much of it. It wasn't until a while later that she went to use the kids bathroom and saw that the door was open again. She found me in our room and asked if I had opened it. 
I said I didn't. With more incidents of lights being found on and doors opening, it all came to a head near the end of October when I was washing dishes in the kitchen. Above the sink facing the living room is a small window that allows someone in the kitchen to look out into the dining room and living room and additionally the back door, which is a sliding glass door. Important detail. After the kids had been put to bed and were asleep, my wife and I set about our nightly duties of chores to finish before the next day started. As I was washing dishes, I looked up from the sink and saw in the glass of the sliding glass door a reflection of a large shadow in the hallway to the kids' bathroom. It quickly entered the bathroom and I immediately walked over, turning on the light and seeing nothing there. I went to my bedroom where my wife was vacuuming and I asked her if she by chance went into the kids' bathroom for whatever reason. I wasn't surprised by her response when she said no and I told her what I saw. It was after this event and subsequently Halloween that all the activity seemed to stop. Months passed by again and jumped to 2020, August. As soon as the activity started again, I started to keep a journal of all the findings. That way there was a record. On August 10th, I went out to go to the bathroom in the kids' bathroom before going to bed and heard a small child giggle. Both children were fast asleep. August 11th, my wife was bathing our daughter and for the first time in a year, our little girl started to shriek in fear unless she was out of the bathroom. August 13th, while getting ready for bed, our son knocked on our door. I'm always the one to answer and he told me that he was afraid. He wouldn't elaborate on what, but when I laid him down in his bed, he begged for the closet door to be closed. The closet was never been a problem, and a few nights after this, we returned to it being open, and haven't experienced something like this again. August 15th, my wife and I had an argument, and I went out to the couch to sleep for the night. As I was tossing and turning, I heard a child's voice in the night say, uh-huh, as if answering a question. I forced myself to go to sleep. Both myself and my wife have caught our son speaking to himself as well. My wife told me that once she heard him saying, Ow, stop it, you're hurting me. And when she went to go check on him, he was in the hallway by the kid's bathroom, holding his arm. During the daytime, the kids were playing, and both me and my wife were doing our own thing. As I was sitting on the couch, our son ran behind the couch, stopped and then said, And how would you do that? Out of the blue. I turn to him and ask him who he's talking to, and after a moment's hesitation, he says nobody. I told him I heard him say something, and then he insisted he didn't say anything. One occasion, my wife was sleeping on the couch, and in the middle of the night, heard a man's whisper say, Don't get up, to which she promptly obeyed. It was the night after I woke up from my sleep in bed, to see a shadow shape standing over me with piercing red eyes. I felt as if it was going to hurt me. My wife and I have naturally begun to our interest in the spiritual world. We began researching and looking for ways to go about this. We've purchased a Ouija board and with no results from a medium, a supposedly haunted ring. If our apartment was going to be haunted, we wanted to know by who and with what intentions. It seems as if our mail order ghost has already made their home as one morning our front door was unlocked and slightly ajar. Nothing stolen. Tonight as I write this, my wife and I were watching TV on the couch and decided to call it a night. But as we went to our bedroom, I noticed a low scratching sound coming from the record player. I opened it up and saw the turntable was moving as the needle was off its holder, turning the record player on. I replaced the needle and tried knocking the player a few times to see if it could have been easily bumped and knocked off. But no, the only way to move that needle was to pick it up with your fingers and set it down. I was reminded of one other time that this happened long before we bought any haunted items. I'm thoroughly convinced my apartment is haunted. People die in them way too often to think about it not a possibility. And if nobody died here, the cemetery across the road definitely doesn't bring me any comfort. As I write this, I can say that two distinct entities can be somewhat accounted for. A small child ghost and something else. 
or maybe something that wants to be viewed as a child, but let's think happy thoughts. We still live here to this day, and if any new events happen, I can be sure to update you. Autumn is just beginning, and that's when things seem to really get interesting around here. This is how my parents have always told this story to me. I was three at the time, so I really don't remember it at all, personally. But this is the story they say I told them. My mom says one night in the middle of the night, I came bursting into her room hysterically telling them to get the lady with a hole in her stomach out of my room. My parents, obviously perplexed, went into my room and checked it out. They found nothing, except my dad said my room was freezing. It was the middle of the summer, and we didn't have air conditioning, so it was weird. My parents, assuming it was a nightmare, asked me to describe the woman to them. They said my description was incredibly vivid, that I described her hair and her face, what she was wearing, and very specific birthmarks she had. My mom said my dad's face after the explanation went pale, and he just walked outside. My mom, once she got me to calm down, put me to sleep, and went outside to talk to my dad. My dad broke down once she went outside and told her the story of his first girlfriend, the only other girl he had dated seriously besides my mom. My dad's first girlfriend killed herself by shooting herself in the stomach. He was so freaked out because I had described her to a T, even mentioning her very specific birthmarks. My mom had never heard about her before this point, as my dad didn't like to talk about it. She, his ex-girlfriend, called him the morning before she killed herself, and he didn't catch her call because he was out surfing with his friends. My mom has speculation on why she chose to haunt me. She thinks she had to tell my dad something. There are speculations on what that something is. Also, it's highly speculated among her friends, and my dad believes it too, that she didn't commit suicide, but was murdered by her current boyfriend at the time. My dad and her were already broken up by the time she committed suicide. To understand the story better, you need to know what a Tao Tao Mona is. It's a term from my people's native language, Chamorro from Guam, that best translates as forefathers, but it has a broader meaning than that. Our culture, before the introduction of Catholicism by the Spanish conquistadors, practiced spiritual worship, veneration of deceased ancestors. The Tautamona, who were believed to play an active role in our daily lives. This belief and the inspired traditions are still prevalent in our culture today. You'd also need to know what a latte stone is. Latte stones are a stone sculpture consisting of a tapering, ascending foundation with a bowl-shaped stone placed on top, but not hollowed out. These were used to elevate huts by our ancestors, and as grave markers as well. Some are as small as three feet tall, and others up to 15 feet high. I live in a modern development at the top of a hill called Latte Heights as an adolescent. It's called Latte Heights because there is an authentic ancient Latte Stone Park at one end with several latte stones carved and placed by our ancestors. These were not disturbed by the developers of the housing track. There's a park on the opposite end of the development, about three quarters of a mile away, and a parkway that connects the two that runs through the entire Latte Heights development. Along the parkway, where it intersects with streets, are the bus stops where we caught the buses to school. When I was in my teens, the bus stops were made of wood and were essentially an eight-foot square wooden box lined with benches on the inside and an opening facing the street. One night, my friend and I were smoking a cigarette in a bus stop from which the backside had been kicked out. We were just chilling, talking shit as teens do, when the bushes and tall grasses across the street started rustling, quite violently, much as if a bear were in them. And of course, there were no bears in Guam. So we were just laughing and saying it was the Tautamona, but were only mildly spooked by it. We continued to smoke and kind of joke about the Tautamona in the bushes. Suddenly, then, the bushes behind us started rustling violently in the same fashion. We were completely freaked out. 
because nothing had crossed the street. Nor was there any pause in the activity across the street and the rustling behind us. The transition was instantaneous. One moment it was across the street, next it was behind us. Naturally, we leapt out of the bus stop. My heart was tearing out of my chest and I'm sure my friends was too. We commented to one another that this was indeed a Tautamona. So we decided to finish our cigarettes in the path between two of our friends' houses, which were just a few yards away from that bus stop. Why didn't we run? Well, Tautamonas aren't exactly feared. Their role to the living is like that of a respected elder. You only fear them if you've done something really bad. Anyway, no sooner had we taken a puff when the figure of a young woman emerged from behind the house on the right and floated the distance to and behind the house on the left. We were stunned and paralysed. She had no legs, just a white, cloud-dense but opaque figure, clearly female from head to about mid-thigh. She didn't walk, she floated exceptionally smoothly over an uneven path. When we gathered the courage, we followed the figure, which had disappeared, despite the tall cinder block fence obstructing the path. There was absolutely nowhere for a living person to hide. The only explanation for me was it was not a person, but a spirit. I'll never forget that experience. It was a long time ago, but still as vivid as today, as it was when it happened. I don't think she was trying to scare us, or at least not terrorise us. She may have been doing her duty as a Tautamona to reprimand us for being out late, smoking cigarettes and using profanity. She may have just been playful, perhaps just entertaining herself and us all at the same time. Now for the sake of context to that specific night, I was at home alone with my two dogs. It was late at night, so it was completely dark outside, aside from a dim light shining partially over my neighbor's fence into my yard. It was about 2 a.m. and I was up late, no lifing another Skyrim playthrough. My dogs started to bark a little bit, which usually means they hear or see either a person or animal. So I walked out and looked out the sliding glass door and saw nothing. So I told them to stop and went back to my room. About 10 minutes later, I heard the loudest yelp from my husky ever. For all the husky owners out there, you know that huskies yelping isn't uncommon because they're a very vocal breed, but this was different. In the year and a half that I've had her, I've accidentally stepped on her tail. Stuff has fallen and scared her. She's been bitten by another dog and I've never heard her yelp this loud. I ran out to the living room to see what was going on and her and my German Shepherd were laying together under my dining room table, shaking, and she had a small drop of blood on her ear. My dogs never lay with each other. Don't get me wrong, they love each other, but whenever one gets close to the other, it always results in a fight, so they generally will lay separately unless they want to play. I assumed it was an animal, and considering my neighbourhood borders a forested area, I grabbed my dad's pistol just in case it was a rabbit, because... Occasionally, we'll get rabid raccoons in my town, and I've heard stories about even rabid coyotes. I walked out and turned the light on to look out the window, and for about five seconds I saw nothing. And right when I was about to look away, I heard the gravel crunch, so I looked back out again. I again saw nothing, so I decided since I have a pistol, I'm probably safe to walk out. And right as I reached for the door, a hand came flying towards the part of the glass right next to my face. And what appeared to be a male in his late teens to early twenties stared at me with a blank and expressionless face. Normally I'd assume this was either some lunatic or someone trying to fuck with me, if not for the fact that his eyes were a reflective deep black, almost like obsidian. Also, I don't know if this is cliche or not, but I've never felt such a sense of terror in my entire life. I've been in life-threatening situations before. I've dealt with a home intruder before. I've even been shot at before, and I've never ever felt such a primal and intense sense of terror in my entire life. The shock made me fall over, but when I looked back with the gun trained, 
he was gone. I was still in a state of shock, so instead of going out there alone, I called my neighbour and he came with a shotgun. We both went out back together and saw nothing. Not the person, not any footprints in the gravel and dirt, no handprints on the window. Literally nothing, so I decided it probably wasn't worth filing a police report. I checked over the security camera footage and saw nothing. I used a fingerprint kit on the glass and found nothing aside from myself and my dad's prints. It's been about four days so far and I haven't seen anything, but I left some cornstarch in the backyard to see if there were any prints there and haven't seen any. This house has been in my family for 60 years now and there hasn't been any notable incidents that would leave me believe that a spirit has a reason to haunt my house, considering they do exist. My grandfather bought this house directly after it was built, so he would probably know if anything happened. As far as the area, it's a relatively peaceful community, and as far as accidents or murders, there aren't any that I've been linked to, and none have happened in my area. Again, I'm an extremely sceptical person, so I'd like to believe that this was just someone messing with me, but I didn't recognise the person, and I don't know how a person could achieve making their eyes look like that aside from contact lenses. But I feel like if someone scared me with contact lenses, I'd probably know them, and everyone that knows me understands that they would get shot or bit by dogs if they pulled some shit like that. Again, I'm on bad terms with the local church, and I don't know anyone from any other churches, so I'm reluctant to look there for help. The only reason I can think of that it may be something that isn't human is my ex was borderline obsessed with the occult. And when she cheated on me, I broke up with her and grilled her for a few hours. So I guess it's possible that she did something to my house. I don't know. We've been broken up for over a year now. And I haven't seen her since then. In my house in the early 2000s, I had lots of VHS tapes. I remember watching over and over, but there was only one I only recall putting on twice. And even then, I only briefly saw what it had on it. It was some animation with puppets, which might have been stop motion animated, or the puppets controlled like the way the Muppets are, or with strings like in Thunderbears, I can't remember. Might have been a mix, but in the few shots burned into my memory of this thing, the puppets looked like they were being controlled like Muppets but sure as hell weren't as family friendly looking. The first time I put the video in there is the scene of a little boy sleeping in his bed in a dark room. And I remember he probably had red hair and looked somewhat realistic, which was what was scary about this show. I'm from the UK and I used to watch Rosie and Jim. And if you haven't heard of it, look it up. The character Jim is what this boy looked like, except more realistic. The boy's head is only seen lying on the pillow, and then an old man, which I guess is his granddad, is seen talking to him by the bedside. The old man looks kind of like the doctor from Back to the Future, but as a realistic puppet. I remember my dad seeing me watching this and being like, turn this off, whatever this is. Then I put the video in again some other time and saw a different scene. The boy was outside in the daytime in some backyard or alleyway. I don't know if it was some place outside a house door. There was a shot of the boy looking at me and then a shot of the old man standing on his doorstep looking at the boy. And I think there was a dog barking in the background too. Weird, I know. The beard was so spooky, like it had no box or any label identifying it. And I remember finding such a video and putting it in again, hoping it wasn't the scary puppets and was relieved to see it was Pingu. I remember watching a short film from the early 90s called Tom Thumb, featuring stop motion puppets and real humans, which kind of looked like this thing, and might have been some surreal short film made by similar artists. The grainy quality of the show makes me think it must have been made in the 60s to 90s. It's a mystery as to what this video's thing was meant to be, how it ended up in our house, and what became of it. was probably 11 or 12. This happened a long ways down our street, 
On the corner, there was a two-story greenhouse with a large red gate. We lived in a historical neighbourhood in the south. I can't remember if we were driving or walking when I saw what I saw. It happened sort of fast, I think. I looked over and saw a being, short and stocky in stature, standing and sort of looking over the metal red gate. They had very large eyes, almost like the movie Big Eyes or the paintings by Margaret Keane. They, whoever they were, also had brown scruffy hair. And I was sad thinking wearing a large t-shirt, almost cartoonish, like a drawing. I've always been sensitive and tried to block things out if that makes sense. I didn't want to see anything that wasn't in our world, and I wasn't even sure what I saw that day. If it was just a very, very odd looking person or something else. But it made me shudder and blink to double check what I was there. Ever since I saw something there, behind the red gate, whenever we'd pass, I'd feel uncomfortable and pray I didn't see what I saw again, which makes me think it was more than normal. It happened probably when I was about five, I want to say. It was before my family moved states, and we lived in a two-story house in New England. I'd say our house was at least a hundred years old. That doesn't exactly explain the phenomenon I witnessed, but maybe it had been the site of another house at one time, I'm not sure. A little backstory. I was a pretty sensitive kid, and very in tune, especially around this age. My mom told me she'd often be thinking of something like, I want to make chicken for dinner, and then I'd ask her if we could have chicken for dinner. That's sort of funny thing. It seems dumb and silly, but I also think it's a bit telling. Our laundry units were in the basement of this house. My mom never liked going down there much because it was wet and pretty dark. It smelled like earth. One day, she was carrying me down with her to put a load of laundry in the machine. I asked her, and I remember this pretty clearly, who those people in the corner were. She freaked out and asked what I was talking about. I remember I saw two people there sort of see-through and sort of floating above the ground in the upper corner. One was an adult woman, one was a young boy. They both had buckles on their shoes. I told my mom. Note, I was too young to know about pilgrims or old-fashioned clothing at this age. I didn't learn history in school yet at all. They were wearing odd clothes too. I told my mom. The mom looks angry, but the little boy says it's okay. I remember that. The apparition of the woman did look very unhappy and it scared me, but her son spoke to me and told me it was okay. Anyway, after relaying all this to my mom, she freaked out and we went upstairs fast. I'm not sure what it was. Like I said, I wasn't learning about history at this young age. I didn't watch much TV either because I went to an alternative school. I was always kind of put off by old things and scared of them. We lived in a very historically rich town and neighbourhood for the War of Independence. So two nights ago at about 1.30am, my boyfriend and I were chilling in his car, parked in the driveway in front of the house, for some outside time for a while. From my passenger side view, I'm able to see through the window of the living room diagonally into the kitchen, where the small light above the sink was on. We started talking about video games, so that made us get ready to head back inside. Through the window, I saw a dark shadow pass from the kitchen light into the dark living room. I asked my boyfriend if he saw anything, but he missed it. I'm always reading about supernatural things, so I kept moving my head back and forth to try to replicate the same shadow movements I saw to make sure I wasn't just jumping to conclusions and came back with no results. For more detail, it was pretty quick. If it were a person, it would be like I only saw them from their shoulders down by the time I noticed it go into the dark. About then, which was only probably like a minute later, the kitchen lights went out and my boyfriend saw it too. It's probably my mom who said, yeah, but isn't it always on? That's weird, I said. So yeah, and we spooked, but whatever. Then, the light turns back on, 
again like a minute later, and there's the same shadow. It was only seconds before it walked away again, but it stood still, and I made out a body and an arm. The whole dark figure had a feminine frame, and looked as if they were dragging their hand while looking out of the window. Now, I'm spooked as fuck. My boyfriend was confused too, but insisted that it was his mom probably not being able to sleep. I get pretty spooked easily, but it was weird actually having real visual evidence. Anyway, we got back inside, and I'm like scanning the room for any evidence of anything and saw nothing. There was absolute silence. My boyfriend's parents were asleep. I was acting so weird. I was so scared, honestly. I was so freaked out, my boyfriend thought I was messing with him. Anyway, I wanted to post this that night, but decided it wasn't that cool, and probably his mom. Until now. So we're all eating, and I hear my boyfriend mention the story above, because he started noticing that he'd go from our guest room to the kitchen to get snacks and drinks, and within like 25 to 50 minute intervals, the light would either on or off, with no sounds of his parents moving. Then, his mom straight up replied, Oh yeah, there was a lady who died in that living room, you know. It's probably her. I kid you not, I froze. Then, I learned that that lady who died was best friends with the neighbour across the street, who's a writer. When the writer would get up at odd hours to do her typing, she would see from her window the shadow of her friend. She literally knocked on their door one night to let them know her friend's ghost was there. So now I'm here. A couple of years ago, I was admitted to the mental hospital for suicide attempts and self-harm. After I had filled out some papers and had everything sorted out for my hospital stay, I was brought into the day room to meet the other patients. I sat down and introduced myself. Then, my eyes landed on one of the girls and I froze. I could have sworn I knew her from somewhere, but it was a weird feeling I got. I had to make myself focus on the other people and conversations, or else I would keep thinking about how I knew her. I noticed she looked at me a few times too, like she was trying to figure me out. Later in the meal room, she was staring a hole into me. I noticed, and something was telling me her name was Kelsey. I can't explain it, but I was being told that was her name, and her last name was on the tip of my tongue. Finally, she spoke up and said, Do I know you from somewhere? I told her I had been thinking the same thing about her, and asked where she was from and what her name was. When she replied Kelsey B, I swear my heart stopped for a second. Even the last name that was on the tip of my tongue. I told her my name, and she replied, I know your name from somewhere, I just don't know where from. We spent the next half hour trying to find any possibility of how we could know each other. While we were talking, it felt like I literally knew this girl. However, no family, mutual friends, act mutual activities or clubs, and she had never been to the area I lived in. But I knew her face and voice and name before she even said it. When I got out of the hospital, I searched for her. Found nothing. For the past few years, every few months I search for her using every way possible. When I think of her, I get a yearning feeling. My chest and stomach ache. She wasn't supposed to be a long-term patient, so she's still not there. What teenage, now adult girl has no social media? I can't explain it. Do we know each other in a different universe? Do we have connections from our past lives? There's no way this is a coincidence. This happened many years ago. I think maybe 2010 or 2011. It was winter break and I was out in the woods camping with three other friends. I've been camping on an almost weekly basis for years and occasionally for my whole life and was very familiar with the whole experience of it. For some reason, I was really complacent this time and didn't prepare very well. It was about zero degrees, well below freezing and I just have a sweatshirt and a jacket. Walking around, I was doing fine, although my feet were cold, I remember. 
We found our spot to make camp for the night. We don't use tents or sleeping bags. We built a fire and chatted. I'm growing increasingly miserable as I can't get warm, even with the fire going, especially my feet. I got my feet really close to the fire, boots on, and I can't tell if they're warming up or not. Take the boots off and still can't tell. Can't keep them too close because they'll burn and I'm so cold I won't feel it if they do. I remember being so desperate for warmth, I repeatedly asked my friends if they'd give me anything they have. The only extra piece of gear anyone had is a poncho. I took it, knowing it'll probably do nothing, but I'm really desperate, and I wrapped myself up in it like a blanket. I didn't want to be the reason we have to pack up and go back early on the first night, so I try to just endure this as best as I can. I'm laying there on the ground, so damn cold, and I remember feeling a bit sleepy. I went into it and passed out. After some unknown amount of time, everything from here on was relayed to me later, some large creature comes crashing through the forest, snapping branches and making all kinds of crazy sounds. My friends try to wake me up, but I'm unconscious from the cold and won't wake up. This creature comes up to right behind where I'm laying on the ground, and my friends are yelling at it, and it supposedly is acting very loud and seemingly aggressive. Shaking trees right behind me, maybe about 15 feet away. This would be a good point to mention, there are no bears or major game in this area, other than deer. Friends and I all grew up in a wooded country area, and know the behaviour of deer well. They don't violently break and shake trees with this intensity. The creature has a standoff with my friends for a few minutes and I still won't wake up. They make the decision to escape with their own lives and leave me laying there on the ground. I don't blame them. Do what you gotta do. Sometime in less than what I guess to be 30 minutes after this, I woke up. I felt a strange sense of peace and comfort. Somehow I was warm. Despite hours next to the fire and still descending into hypothermia and temperature continuing to drop, Nobody tending the fire. I woke up and was warm. I woke up, as I said, with a feeling of peace. Immediately noticing my friends aren't here with me, I'm unfazed by it and I'm just perfectly content to sit there and exist. After maybe about 10 minutes or so of sitting there awake and warm, I hear my friends coming back. They see from a distance my silhouette sitting next to the fire and run back. They're urgently asking me questions if I'm okay, what happened, etc. Told them I don't know what they're talking about. They relayed this to me and their decision was we're going back home early because of that. Not because of the cold. We all talked about our experiences and were pretty confused by the whole thing. My feet were purple for like two months. I constantly had a slight feeling of being cold and the skin on my feet and legs hurt a lot for a while. Healed up fine, although I think I get cold easier now. Been about 10 years since this happened and everybody is still very curious about it. I'm very convinced. It's not a joke. So we decided to go somewhere haunted during the day. There's this cemetery in Santa Cruz we decided to check out. We went in and walked around and nothing out of the ordinary happened, so we decided to leave. The cemetery is on a supposed haunted road that leads up into the woods. This road is said to be haunted by a lady in white that tries to hitchhike into your car. I had forgotten this fact until the day after. Alright, so along this road we're driving, down it leads into a forested area. A couple of miles down from the cemetery, you can pull to the side of the road and walk along this hiking trail. So we decided to hike this trail because I completely forgot the road was also haunted. So I wasn't even looking for anything paranormal. Anyways, we start hiking this trail in the afternoon. 10 minutes into the trail, we stumble along abandoned train tracks and a barely standing bridge for the train that used to run along those tracks. It looked cool. So we decided to go down this hill right by the bridge that lets you go under the dilapidated bridge. We go down there and just mess around, looking at the cool architecture. After we had our view, we started back up the little hill that leads back to the trail. 
When we get to the top, we're a little exhausted because the hill is kind of steep and you have to use the trees around you as leverage to climb back up. So we're standing around back on the trail when we both notice something out of the ordinary. We hear a voice, like a grown man shouting and screaming very angrily. When I say angry, I mean angry. This voice sounded like a rage-filled, hatefully murderous man. We quiet down and I can tell the voice is very far away. Almost sounded like it was in the mountains around us. Sounded more than 500 feet away, that's for sure. We both look at each other like, what the fuck is that? We stand around listening for like 15 seconds and next thing we know, the voice came down the trail from what sounded like hundreds of feet away to being like right down the end of the trail. The inhuman speed the voice came closer to us was unnatural. I noticed the voice coming from down the trail and I'm thinking to myself, this voice sounds like it's someone who's about to kill someone out of rage. But the weird thing is that the voice is speaking what I can only call gibberish. I understood not one word it was saying. I instantly get this fight or flight feeling all in my body because the voice starts getting very loud and closer to us at inhuman speeds. I told my brother to pick up some huge sticks with me to defend ourselves because even though the voice came out of nowhere and moved down the trail at lightning speeds, I still had the assumption it was some kind of crazy person ready to kill someone. We pick up the sticks and run down the trail back to the car. Now here's the weird part. As we're running away from this voice that's coming down the other end of the trail, I hear the voice come up behind us in an instant. It sounded like he was no more than 10 feet behind us, chasing us back to the car. I turn around, even though I don't want to, because I have to see how close the psycho is to us. As I look back and hear the voice right behind me, I see no one. I tell my brother to run faster because the voice is right behind us, yelling in absolute rage, but I see no one chasing us. We started picking up speed, and the craziest thing in my life happened. The voice starts panning around us in 360 audio. I hear the voice yelling in gibberish right behind me. Then it starts panning to my left, through the trees, just off the trail. Then the voice is right in front of us, and it slides to the right side of the trail and then back behind us, all in a matter of 10 seconds. At this point, me and my brother were very creeped out and ran the rest of the trail back to the car. The voice kept following us down the trail. I remember after hearing the voice panning around us and hearing it reverberate around the woods, I started praying to help me come out of here alive. After we make it around halfway down the trail to my car, the voice disappears. I remember slowing down exhausted and we started talking about what we heard. I asked my brother if he also heard the voice slide in circles around us and he said he heard it too. At that point, I knew I wasn't hallucinating or imagining it. I asked my brother if he heard how it sounded like gibberish, but like a man screaming at the top of his lungs in rage. He said he heard the same thing. We finally get into the car and I drive the fuck out of there in a heartbeat. I remember the car ride was silent for like five minutes as we just sat there thinking about what happened. That's when I remembered that the whole road was haunted and not just the cemetery. I had been down that trail alone a few months before this experience and had nothing weird happen. That was one of the weirdest things I've ever experienced in my entire life. To this day, I've never been back down that trail and never plan on it either. Everything I've written down is the absolute truth and nothing has been altered. The Santa Cruz area and mountains are known for cults and very dark magic being performed in them. So around 2016, I'd been living in my new house for about a year or two with my mom's now ex-husband and my mom. After a while, it began to feel weird being alone there. And at night, it would feel like I was being watched from my hallway. I would go to sleep with the door open, never once falling asleep, not facing the door. Anyway, after a few months of this, one night while falling asleep with my TV on, I wake 
in a dream. At this time, my bed was laid on a side in front of a large window, and my door was on an opposite side of the room. So, I think I'm awake, and I notice that on my side, my room is only faintly lit by an orange street lamp, and as I turn my head towards the door, something is in my doorway. It looked like the shadow monster from Stranger Things Season 2, but in a more humanoid form. Yet it looked to be about 8 feet tall, and I could see no eyes, but it felt like the eyes of a predator were on me. It was arched in a way that I felt like I was going to be attacked. I opened my window, jumped out, and ran down to the street. I'm running in jello about half a block down. I feel out of breath. I turn and look. I see my street and a street lamp. I try to run further, but I can't. We turn around again, and I see it standing there under the street lamp. It screams a loud, harmonious, guttural and terrifying scream. One that makes your stomach drop. At that moment, I woke up and my abdomen shot up. I'm gasping for air and crying. My TV was turned off and I was in darkness. I woke up around midnight, I believe, and I stayed up until 3am watching Spongebob or something. I know the TV thing could be explained like automatic turn off or my mom turning it off, but I have reason to believe she didn't do that. I also had AT&T, and usually after a while, it would go to some blue screen instead of turning off. Either way, waking up again in the way dream started terrified me. After that, I smudged, and I think I told whatever that was to leave me alone. Now that I think about it, I believe I put salt in my bedroom doorway. I don't remember anything happening after that, but my mom and I ended up moving into another haunted place because she got a divorce. If anyone has any idea about what this was, or has seen something similar, I would be interested in hearing. It didn't feel human. I was with my girlfriend preparing dinner. The year was 2015. Everything seemed normal. I put on some music and the speakers were in my room. While we were cooking, I noticed that the music was no longer being listened to. I was surprised that something happened with the internet because it was Spotify. I went to the bedroom and I noticed that the playlist continued but the volume knob had been set to zero. I didn't pay much attention to it at that moment. I set the knob again and went to the kitchen to continue with dinner. Not even two minutes passed when again I noticed that no music was being heard. This time it seemed something strange to me. I lived alone and we were just my girlfriend and I. I went into my room and this time the knob was on one so I could lightly hear some music. I was surprised because it was a physical and not digital fault. Again I turned the knob and returned to the kitchen. I tried not to think about that and concentrate on cooking when suddenly I clearly heard things on the floor this time in the studio that was next to my room. It bothered me the idea of passing by these things instead of enjoying a pleasant evening with my girlfriend. I asked her if she had heard that sound and she said no. I replied that it was clearly a noise from the studio, so she told me, let's take a look. In effect, there was things on the floor. I wanted to think that it had simply fallen. We picked them up, turned off the lights and left. We were in the kitchen again when we heard another noise. This time, she could also appreciate it. I told her something is happening and she, being a very religious person, told me not to worry. We went to the studio and this time the light was on and there were again some things thrown away. There were no open windows or wind currents. It seemed very strange to us. We lifted everything and before leaving I pronounced aloud that I will leave the light on and we retired kind of nervous. We hadn't reached the kitchen when noises were heard again. This time I was really afraid that it was a thief who had entered the house. We ran to the study and the light was off and the TV that was there was on with static. We looked at each other and I told that it was not normal that something was happening and we should do something. She proposed to pray. We went to the kitchen, she took my hands, we said two prayers that she knew and when she finished, something was heard again. I wanted to go see, but I was shocked to see that just outside the kitchen, 
there was an inflatable toy that I used to have to punch for fun on the studio. It was horrible. I had no idea how it got there. I felt very scared. I didn't know if it was something paranormal or a person entered the house and he was playing us the worst joke ever. My girlfriend asked me what was wrong with me. Why I stood at the door. I told her not to leave the kitchen that I didn't want her to see that. But she leaned out and screamed. I tried to calm her down. Nothing had ever happened in that house. We were very scared and at that moment the bell rang. I answered on the intercom and nothing. Every time I was more nervous but I tried to stay calm. I walked towards her and the bell rang again. I answered and nothing. I told her let's get out of here. Something or someone is bothering us. It occurred to me to go to the house of a cousin who lived nearby. And then the light started to blink. It was horrible. Getting to the street was a great relief. And by the way, it was completely desolate. We walked a few blocks until we reached my cousin's house. We told her everything while our hands were still shaking. She believed us and said she had some holy water and that we had to go back because what happened to us was not normal. When we came back with the holy water, you could hear loud music from the street. We opened the door with fear and immediately my cousin began to sprinkle holy water all over the place. The infl inflatable toy was in another place. It seemed that it had moved a few meters from where we saw it last time. The knob of the speakers was at maximum and all the lights in the house were on. It seemed that they had had a small party without us. It was horrible. I was never skeptic to the paranormal, but I didn't believe everything I heard until that night. For my good luck, I can say that after using the holy water, nothing else happened in that house. I no longer lived there. I threw the toy and that girlfriend is now my wife and we know that all that was real. These spirits or entities exist and we must be careful, have faith in God and not let them disturb us. Back in the 80s, my Aunt Kay was in her early 20s. This was before she married my uncle, and when she would drive long distances back and forth between her parents and my uncles to visit. It was a transitional period for them. He had just graduated, and she hadn't moved out yet to be with him. It was a long drive across several states, through the desert, which took her hours. This desolate highway would have stretches of road that lasted hundreds of miles, where you quite often wouldn't see another driver, let alone a gas station. So Aunt Kay set out and began one of these journeys. A couple hours into the drive, she noticed a dark vehicle slowly catching up to her. She barely noticed. As she continued to sing along to a tape, until the vehicle got aggressively close. She turned off the music and looked into her rear view mirror, seeing the vehicle flash its brights and a hand pointing at a car and monitoring to pull over. Alarmed, she quickly slowed and began to look for a good place to pull off the road, to see what must be wrong with her car. The second she began to pull off the road, she said she felt and heard as clear as day, don't pull over. Then again stronger, don't pull over. Call it God, intuition, or just a gut feeling. But a jolt of adrenaline and fear shot through Aunt Kay's body as she hit the gas and peeled back out onto the highway. Heart pumping, she silently asked herself what the hell that was, as she saw the vehicle peel out behind her. The dark vehicle continued to closely follow, flash their brights and motioned for her to pull over. Fear and confusion set in, she began to question what was going on. Why was the driver motioning for her to pull over? Was there something wrong with her car? And what the hell was that warning she felt? It would have been a severe situation if her car broke down out there, especially before cell phones, but she pressed on. Just as her resolve wavered, she started questioning if she truly did feel what she felt. She started slowly back down when the dark vehicle picked up speed. It entered into the oncoming traffic lane and came to my aunt's car. The driver smiled, pointed, motioned and mouthed the words pull over to my aunt. She said the second she looked into his eyes, she felt pure evil. 
She felt a horribly sick feeling in the pit of her stomach and again heard the words in her head, don't pull over. She described him as looking scary, greasy, and noticed he was missing a couple teeth in his smile that she'll never forget. That sent chills through her. This quickly dispelled any thought she had of pulling over and she put the pedal to the metal to try to lose him. He chased after her. She slowed down. He slowed down. She sped up, he sped up. It got to the point that he began to try to push her car off the road. Aunt Kay was to the point of tears as this creep continued to terrorise her alone, out in the middle of nowhere. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, she sees a couple of semis off in the distance. She felt if only she could get close or even get in between those trucks, she would be safe, so she took off. He continued to flash his lights, honk his horn, and try to hit her car until she got close enough to the trucks. As she got in between them, she saw the dark vehicle slow way down and eventually disappear from view. She stayed with the trucks for a couple hours until she felt safe enough to pull over at a gas station and cry. Fast forward several years, my aunt and uncle are married. He's working at a law firm as a high profile criminal prosecutor in Las Vegas. She's now a full time mom of several young children. Since I've known my aunt, she's been obsessed with true crime. Dateline, 2020, and unsolved mysteries were always playing at their house. This day was no different. She was folding laundry in the kitchen while listening to the TV in the other room. The interviewer was talking about a man who was being interviewed on death row. As she paired another match of socks, she heard the man describe one of his tactics for procuring victims. According to him, He would wait along the side of the highway. A car would go by with a family and he'd wait. Another car with a male driver would go by and he'd wait. But every so often, a car would go by with a pretty woman driving alone. So I'd pull out behind and follow them. I'd flash my brights, honk and motion for him to pull over. Aunt Kay, paralysed, continued to listen. When they would eventually pull over, I'd tell them to pop the hood and I'd be able to tell them what was wrong with their car. They would, and I'd yank a couple of wires. When the car wouldn't start, I'd tell them no problems. My buddy has a shop in the next town. I can give you a ride and he'll give you a fair deal. My aunt slowly moved into the living room. They'd get in, and I'd rape and kill them. Bury them anywhere in the desert. When asked how many times he did this, he responded, They'll never find all the bodies. I can't even count. And how many got away? Two or three. My aunt stood alone, staring into the same toothless grin she saw on that highway that day. It was Henry Lee Lucas. This happened to one of my friends. He and two of his buddies decided to go camping one weekend in the Uinta Mountains, Utah. They wanted to go out in the middle of nowhere to really get away from civilization and just chill and fish and stuff like that. All three of them are pretty outdoorsy and experienced with camping and backpacking, so this was no big deal for them. They went to a trailhead in the Uintas, hiked about half a mile up the trail, and then turned off the trail and just hiked for about four miles away from the trail. They had little trail markers so that they wouldn't get lost coming back. They find a spot and there was no sign of anyone around. The ground looks untouched by humans. There was also a brook close by, so they decided to set up camp. All three of them had camping hammocks, so they set those up in trees and then just kind of explored around for a bit before they decided to build a fire and eat and stuff like that. Eventually, the evening rolled around, so they built a fire and made tin foil dinners and were just shooting the shit. When they decided to go to bed, the guy who told me this said he remembered laying in a sleeping bag in his hammock, thinking that even though there was the sound of the water in the brook close by, and every now and then there'd be like insect noises or whatever, the woods were so quiet. Like, being out of civilization made him realise how rarely we as humans experience real silence, since we all fill our days with so many noises and distractions. He said it felt eerie. He could feel himself starting to doze off, 
when the worst thing in the world happened to him. He had to pee, when already being comfy and warm. He figured he'd rip the band-aid off and go pee before he fell asleep for the night. He put on his hemp lamp, got on his hammock, and walked about 30 feet away from his buddies in their hammocks to pee. When he was walking over, he thought he saw something dart out of sight on naturally fast, and heard a crack of a branch. But because they were so far out in the wilderness, near a brook, he didn't think too much of it. He unzipped his pants, peed, and then went right when he was zipping his pants back up. His headlamp shone on something on the ground that paralysed him with fear. A few feet away from where he was peeing was unmistakably fresh human footprints on the ground. It had rained in the mountains the day before, so the earth was soft in some areas, and there was no doubt in his mind that these were not only human footprints, but that whoever made the footprints was barefoot. The creepiest thing was that the footprints weren't staggered. They were side by side, facing where the guys were camping. It was as though someone was just standing still at the edge of their camping spot, in total darkness, just watching them. Those were the only footprints my friend could see. No other prints leading to or away from the ones he saw. Totally freaked out, he ran back to his hammock and got his knife that he always takes camping. He loudly whispered his two friends' names, but they were already asleep so they didn't answer. He debated whether he should wake them up, but decided against it because there was no real physical threat he could think of that would justify waking them up. He put his headlamp on a brighter setting and shone it up in the trees and around the general area of where he had peed. Nothing. He didn't sleep that night. He laid in his hammock wide awake with his knife in his hand all night. Those footprints looked as though someone had been standing there moments before he walked up to that spot to pee. He felt like he and his friends were not alone. When it reached early in the morning, when the sun just barely started to rise, my friend decided he was going to pack his stuff up because he was still spooked and wanted to start hiking back to their car when his friends were up. When he was taking down his hammock, he saw another set of fresh footprints. But this time, they were like 10 feet away from his hammock. Like on the edge of the trees behind his hammock. As if someone had been standing about 10 feet away from his hammock, just staring at him. Again, no other footprints leading to these two footprints. He was full on freaked out by this point, so we woke up his friends and showed them the footprints. And they got the hell out of there. Sometimes... You're not as alone as you think you are.